Genesis 24 reveals some amazing details about Isaac after he was almost sacrificed in Genesis 22. After this session, you might have more questions than answers, so just buckle up. See, this chapter is all about Abraham getting a bride for his son Isaac, who doesn't seem to be with Abraham. Why is that? This chapter is not just about Isaac finding a wife. It's actually about something so much deeper. Let's just say there's a revelation of Jesus within this chapter. Let's jump into Genesis 24 and I'll show you what I mean. This kind of Bible study format might be new to some of you, um, so if you're not familiar with this approach to meditating on scripture, I hope you'll hang around to the end, give us a chance to really understand why we do this kind of Bible study. And if you haven't watched the last session on Genesis 23 or the rest of our Genesis teachings, um, I'll link that below in the description as well as in this video for you to check out. The last thing we saw was that uh, Sarah was buried in a cave in the field of Ephron, which is, uh, he's a Hittite man, and now we see Abraham was old. This is going to be a longer one because this is a 65 verse chapter. And I don't want to break it up because there's too much within this that we need to keep all unified. So now Abraham was old, well advanced in years, and the Lord had blessed Abraham in all things. Okay, I think this is very important to everything we're about to see in the next chapter, Genesis 25, just to skip forward a little bit. We're going to see Isaac, who essentially takes over as the patriarchal head. Abraham is moved out of the picture. Isaac becomes the focus. And Isaac is said to be blessed in all things by God Most High, who we see in this chapter is blessing Abraham. And Abraham said to his servant, who, by the way, we've already seen who this servant is. Abraham had a little conversation with God in Genesis, I want to say, 15, um, about, hey, Eliezer of Damascus is going to inherit everything. He's the oldest in my household. He's my servant. I don't have any children. And now we see Eliezer of Damascus here um, comes, or rather Abraham comes to him. He's the oldest of Abraham's household who had charge of all that he had. And Abraham goes, put your hand under my thigh. Essentially, he's about to make Eliezer <clears throat> oath, uh, make an oath and a promise to Abraham. Um, and if you remember, Abraham was not previously happy a few chapters ago about the fact that he had no kids and now Eliezer was going to be the heir of his estate and, and, and now Eliezer is going to be sent forth to find a wife for the one who is the true heir of Abraham's house that is Isaac. So let's just keep tabs on who each of these characters are and what we know about them thus far in the narrative. Verse 3, here's the promise. I'm going to make you swear by the Lord, the God of heaven and the God of earth, or God of the earth, that you will not take a wife for my son from the daughters of the Canaanites. So this is incredibly important to Abraham. I wonder why though. You know, when we ask questions about the text, what is the big deal about intermarrying with the Canaanites? Uh, where does Abraham get this idea from that this is not okay or it's not good? Um, because he's okay with living among the Canaanites, but apparently intermixing with them for some reason is just off the table, not acceptable. So instead of Isaac getting a wife from among the Canaanites, whom Abraham says, I dwell among, instead he says, go to my country, go to my kindred, and take a wife for my son Isaac. The servant said to him, perhaps the woman may not be willing to follow me to this land like a total stranger coming to pick up a woman and say, I promise there's a husband waiting for you. Like, it's kind of weird. What if she doesn't come? Must I then take your son back to the land from which you came? Um, so emphasis right here on Abraham's country and his kindred. If you remember, um, God already told Abraham in the beginning of the Abraham story to leave behind his family, leave behind his father's house, the land, the possessions. And so where does Abraham get this idea uh, that his descendants need to marry within his own family and household? If God said to leave all that behind, you know, where does this idea come from? Also, when the servant goes, well, what if the woman doesn't come? You know, for the woman to leave her family, her land, just like Abraham did, uh, would take a big, a big amount of faith, right? To trust that this person coming to get you hey, really has good intentions, you can trust them, that there's really a husband on the other side of this. So the, the leap we saw Abraham make all the way back in Genesis 12 to leave his father's land and house, now we're going to see Rebecca, who's going to be the wife of Isaac, she's going to take that same leap of faith leaving her household and her family and her father's name and such. And the servant... Um, says to him, what if she doesn't come? Must I take your son back to the land from which you came, right? So there's something about the land. The descendants, cool. 
but the land apparently unacceptable. Abraham says, make sure you do not take my son back there. Like, oh, we could take brides from there, but we can't go back to that land, right? So Isaac's allowed to have a wife, but he's not supposed to go back to the land. He can bring people out of Ur to be a part of Abraham's household, but he can't settle back into the place that God initially called Abraham out of. And this is probably why Abraham sends a servant. Uh, we can speculate because Abraham does not want Isaac settling there again. The servant is not likely to settle there, being the one in charge of the household and being the, the first in charge servant-wise. It's not likely that the servant's going to settle back in a land that he doesn't even come from. Um, this is Eliezer of Damascus, so that wouldn't even be his homeland. Verse 7, the Lord, the God of heaven, who took me. Right. So this is all a response to what God has done for Abraham. God took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred. I'm going to make this bigger. Um, he took me from my father's house and from the land of my kindred, and he spoke to me and he swore to your offspring, I will give this land. And here's what Abraham says in response or based on the promise God gave to him. He goes, therefore, God will send his angel before you. God will send his angel before you. What's interesting is that whether or not the servant knows this, Eliezer is playing the role of the one who goes ahead of the heir to find a bride, prepare a bride, bring that bride back, and now Isaac will have a wife. So there is both an angel going ahead of Eliezer, and Eliezer is the one going ahead of Isaac to prepare or rather get, acquire a bride for him. So it's like a double thing happening, kind of like what we see in Exodus where Moses leads the people, but there's an angel of God going ahead of them. I think that's a similar idea, not to make Eliezer out to be a, a Moses type, but just the way they're sent and someone's going ahead of them. So everything Abraham is doing in this chapter is in response to the promises of God. So God said, therefore, the best course of action to take is that you should not take my son back there, right? So Isaac, or rather Abraham, knows his future is not back in Ur, but it's in Canaan. That's a big step of faith to not just go back and settle into the place that he was called out of, because we're going to see Israel over and over once they're brought out of Egypt have this kind of, can we go back to Egypt? Like, it was more comfortable. It was more convenient. It was easier. We're familiar with that, right? This desire to go back to what was, you know, in their minds, a better situation, though it was way worse. And then Abraham, for some reason, says, you know what? God's going to send his angel before you. Where does this come from? Because this is what God does when he calls his people out of Egypt again um, to come into a new land, to enter into a new covenant with God. The angel of God is sent ahead of them to prepare a place, to fight their battles, to guide them, to care for them, to give them the land. So how does Abraham know God will do this? We have only so far in the Genesis story seen the exclusive angel of the Lord twice. Once with Hagar, or rather twice with Hagar, and then once with Abraham in Genesis 22 on Mount Moriah when he's about to sacrifice Isaac. So how does Abraham have enough history with this angel of the Lord, enough to be confident that he will be sent ahead of his servant? That God will, don't worry, God's going to take care of it. He's going to prepare. He's going to send an angel ahead of you. You know, how is he so confident in this? Where does this come from? Is it from experience? Did God say, and we're just not told? We'll see later on in scripture, the angel of the Lord is the very name and the very presence of God himself. He carries in him the very name and, um, and authority of God. And so Abraham mentions that God took him, if you read it uh, right here, God took me from my father's house and land. And that's the basis for why Isaac cannot go back there. It's a place to be brought out from, not a place to go back to and settle into. Just as Egypt, again, will be throughout the Old Testament, this temptation for Israel to go back to, look for security and get help, you know, find refuge under the shadow of Pharaoh, that kind of thing. Verse 8, but if the woman is not willing to follow you, you'll be free from this oath. All right, servant, you get a way out. Only you must not take my son back there. Now, remember, where it is that Abraham got called out of was essentially Babylon. That's where Abraham is pulled out of. And then we see the Tower of Babel, Genesis 11. So Abraham knows whatever that land is associated with, we don't go back there. God has something different and new for us. So the servant put his hand under the thigh of Abraham, his master, and swore to him concerning this matter. So the servant is bound by an oath to his master, Abraham, that he's going to do all that he can, at least within his power, 
to bring back a wife for Isaac. Otherwise, he will make sure Isaac at least does not end up back in Ur, where Abraham was called out of. So I think, again, we have an image of a servant being sent ahead um, to bring back a wife for the master's son. You know, this is an image of Moses being sent to Israel as God's redeeming hand and prophet to bring them out of Egypt into a covenant relationship, a marriage-type covenant with God. This is an image of Jesus being sent as the ultimate servant whom Moses prophesied of, right? There will be a prophet who's like me. You better listen to him. Jesus is that ultimate servant who purchases a wife for himself, who purifies and cleanses a bride for himself by his own precious blood to reconcile to himself and his father a bride in covenant relationship. And so there's a lot of that going on here with Isaac being the heir, with Isaac being the one who continues the name. In Genesis 3, we see the promise uh, seed of the woman, that being Jesus and those who follow in his footsteps, a plurality of seed in Christ who crushed the head of the serpent with Jesus as head leading the charge. Verse 10, then the servant took 10 of his master's camels. And I wonder why we're told, I don't know why, I really don't, but I wonder why we are told how many camels specifically are taken. Uh, That number seems irrelevant unless there's some other significance to the story and what's taking place. Hmm. And he departed, taking all sorts of choice gifts from his master. And he arose and went to Mesopotamia, to the place, the city of Nahor, that being the brother, I believe, of Abraham. And he made the camels kneel down outside the city by the well of water at the time of evening, the time when women go out to draw water. Notice the strategic uh, method, the strategy of this servant. I don't think it's just a coincidence that he happens to be out there. I think based on his calculated moves we're about to see that he takes and prays and asks God to establish his steps, it makes sense that the servant at least knows how that culture functions and how women go out to get water around evening when it's cooler for whatever reason. And he knows that likely you go where women are to find a wife. So that'll be by the well. And he makes the camels kneel down outside the city. Um, Just a few things to note here. Uh, When I see the choicest of gifts being brought from, you know, rather with a caravan of people to a bride, Um, Not to make Jesus out to be some woman figure, but in in Matthew's gospel, we see the Magi and the wise men of the East bringing gifts to this Jesus who was born in Bethlehem as king of the Jews. And there's a lot of that, uh, which we'll touch on later on, but just to kind of prime you for when we bring that back into focus. um, Verse 12, this is interesting. The servant goes, O Lord, God of my master Abraham. Okay. This is very important. Abraham is the master of the house right now. And you're going to see a shift at the end of this chapter where the servant, when he sees Isaac, will look at Rebekah and say, there's my master. And it's not Abraham, it's Isaac. But for now, Abraham, rather the servant, Eliezer, is sent by his master Abraham under his authority. And he's saying, God of my master. So we have to ask, what is the servant's relationship to God up to this point? Does he have a relationship with this God only through Abraham? It's Abraham's God, so since I'm in his household, it's just my God too. What makes him think that God will honor this specific request of his? Because he goes, please grant me success today. Please show steadfast love to my master Abraham. Notice the emphasis on God's favor and grace and love towards Abraham. Behold, I'm standing by the spring of water, and the daughters of the men of the city are coming out to draw water. Right, So this is a calculated move. The servant knows what's happening, and then he doesn't trust in that wisdom of his, himself. He asks God to give him favor and success. Either way, we, we see him humbly asking that God would honor these conditions he's about to give God. Like, hey, let the young woman to whom I say, please let down your jar that I may drink. Let that woman who says, drink and I'll water your camels. Let her be the one that you've appointed for your servant, Isaac. It's interesting that Isaac is referred to as God's servant, not to make Abraham not a servant of God, but Abraham is the the master of the house right now. And Isaac is a servant. Um, He has not yet risen to the status of, you know, patriarchal head. Abraham has not died yet. But the servant has a great strategy. I hope you notice it. He surrenders the results to God 
And he knows that his plan won't be successful without God granting him success. In other words, the servant does everything he possibly can to be faithful to Abraham, but he knows that it's God who makes his efforts succeed. And so a question I have is, you know, think about the parameters he set. He's going, God, if the woman says this to me, let her be the one that you've appointed for Isaac. Why these specific conditions? What is the basis for these conditions that he's decided to come up with? Are they, you know, kind of random and, and arbitrary? And when did the servant come up with this plan? You know, did he know he would do this before he ever left? Did it kind of hit him? These are questions we can't necessarily answer um, definitively, but it's interesting to think through. And how did he come up with this scenario? You know, so far we've seen Abraham and we've seen Lot, at least a part of the family of Abraham. And both of them have shown hospitality to strangers and foreigners. So possibly something to think about is that Eliezer has seen hospitality demonstrated by Abraham's family. And so the servant is looking for a woman who would also show compassion on the foreigner and, and take initiative and show hospitality like his master Abraham. Like that would be a good fit for this family. Um, and then he says, let her be the one that you've appointed for your servant Isaac. So the question I have is, does God appoint brides or spouses for people? And if he's doing that for Isaac, if that's true of this scenario, is that true all across the board for all people? Or is this an exception? Is this a rare case? You know, something to think about. Because someone might run to this text and say, soulmate or soul tie or God has a spouse appointed for you and everyone else that's not that spouse is not who he wills for you. And so you can build a kind of theology based off one example in scripture that is more prescriptive than descriptive, or rather descriptive than prescriptive. So the servant seems to be initiating the conditions, right, by going, hey, let this woman be the one God's appointed for Isaac. But he trusted that if that scenario happens, if he does see a woman that says, I'll water your camels too, then he somehow is going, that would be God saying, yes, this is the woman for Isaac. But that takes a step of faith to believe that God would be behind it. Right? There's, there's layers of faith to this. The servant has to believe that God would honor those conditions. The servant has to believe that God would actually work within that. God never said that he would. We don't see that explicitly in the text. And that's not something clearly communicated. But it seems as though the servant is kind of filling in the gaps of, un, of what he doesn't know with what he does know. That he's not just settling for anyone. You know, this is not a very lazy servant. There's, I'm just like, here, listen, if you're a woman, come with me. I got, a, I got a surprise for you. He's a really cool guy. This is a man who really wants to honor his master with excellence and integrity as a faithful servant. And in the mind of this servant, Eleazar, God loving Abraham, if you read the text, by this I will know you've shown love to my master. Right? So there's that reference to Abraham as master again. Right, show my master Abraham, my master Abraham. This servant just sees himself as an ambassador, as a kind of extension. I'm just doing the will of my master, right? And he's going, look, because I know you love Abraham, right? So as proof of that love, would you please give his son a wife? That would be further evidence of God's love for Abraham in the mind of Eleazar. Before he finished speaking, before, before he was even done talking, behold, Rebecca who was born to Bethuel, the son of Milcah, the wife of Nahor, that being Abraham's brother. She came out with her water jar on her shoulder, right? So something I have a question about is why does it matter that Rebekah's coming before he's done praying? Why are we told when she's coming out? Why does it matter that she's heading that direction before he's even like finished? It seems as though God answered his prayer before he finished asking. This is the sovereignty of God at play. The young woman was very attractive in appearance, a maiden, I think a footnote here, a woman of marriageable age, whom no man had known, that being relationally, sexually. Um, she went down to the spring and filled her jar and came up. Then the servant ran to meet her and said, please give me a little water to drink from your jar. There's another instance I can think of where someone who is sent from the people of God is going to ask a woman for something that she has. Um, Elijah will find 
is it the Shunammite woman? I forget. No, it's not the Shunammite woman. But it's a woman who essentially is going, I am about to die, me and my son, so we're just going to eat what's left. And he goes, can I have some? Like, just, just give me a little bit. And then I can also think of later on in John's Gospel, Jesus will meet a woman by a well in Sychar, in Samaria. And she will reference Jacob's well. She'll bring up Jacob in conversation with Jesus. And Jacob is the son of Isaac here. Right? So Isaac here is about to get a bride. Isaac will have a son named Jacob who will continue um, you know, Abraham's name and, and lineage. And Jacob, who's later known as Israel, gets brought up between the Samaritan woman at the well and Jesus. And I think these sto- two stories are profoundly connected. Um, if you have not watched our study on John, John chapter 4, go watch that. I'll link it in the description below. It, it's far too um, deep to get into here. It's like an hour and a half. So go watch that. Um, but either way, she said, drink, my Lord. Sure. She quickly let down her jar upon her hand and gave him a drink. When she finished giving him a drink, she said, I will also draw water for your camels. We're talking first try, first woman that he sees, shoots his shot, and it ends up being the one until they finished drinking. So she quickly emptied her jar into the trough, ran again to the well. This takes work, takes a lot of energy to draw water. She drew for all his camels. How many camels were we told that he had? The answer, if I can find it, 10. 10 camels. It's a lot of work, Rebecca. You're willing to go the distance, go the extra mile until they finish drinking. She, she, if I can talk, shows tremendous hospitality to this stranger whom she doesn't know. She knows nothing about. She's putting a lot of effort into caring for the foreigner and the stranger, huh? And then verse 21 is interesting. As the servant is watching all this unfold, he's gazing at her in silence to learn, right? He's not sure yet, but to learn whether the Lord has prospered his journey or not. So he's not sure yet. This woman meets the conditions of what he asked, for sure. Hey, if you don't know me, my name is Jason, and I have some free gifts for you on our website at abovereproachministry.com. Maybe you want to learn how to study the Bible. We have free Bible classes just for you. Are you maybe a newer believer? Go ahead and check out our Christianity 101 Foundations course. Maybe you hate videos. Well, we have a podcast, so you can listen to all of our messages on whatever podcast platform you prefer. Maybe you want to join or start a discussion group. Check out our map of all the current armed discussion groups all around the world. And do you maybe live near Greenville, South Carolina. If you do, you should check out our church. Visit movementchurchsc.com for more information. And if you'd like to partner with us financially, you can snag a copy of my book, Fruitful, or head over to the donate page and donate through debit or credit card, PayPal, Cash App, Venmo, Patreon, or even mail a check to P.O. Box 509 Inman, South Carolina. And if you want to make a ministry connection, feel free to reach out to me on our website. All right, I know that was a lot, but I'm done. So let's get back to the video. But apparently he's taken it a step further. He's going, I'm not sure if God is giving me success and favor here yet. And I'm just going, well, weren't these the parameters though of your request? Like if this woman came and watered my camels, offered to go the extra mile, let that be the wife for Isaac. And yet not entirely because remember, Abraham sent Eleazar to go and find a wife from his father's house. So the servant does not yet know if this girl is a part of Abraham's family. When the camels finished drinking, the man took a gold ring weighing a half shekel, two bracelets, he's shooting a shot, he's giving it a chance, two bracelets for her arms weighing 10 gold shekels, right? This is a, uh, I guess a question I have is why are we told how heavy the gold is? We're told that whatever the servant brought, it was enough to pack 10 camels full. And we're gonna see there's other men with him, so clearly he is sent packed full of gifts and treasures, and he said, please tell me whose daughter you are. Like, I'm sure he's like, please, please, please say no. Or, Is there room in your father's house for us to spend the night? She said, I'm the daughter of Bethuel, the son of Milcah, whom she bore to Nahor. She added, we have plenty of both straw and fodder and room to spend the night. The man bowed his head and worshiped the Lord and said, blessed be the Lord, the God of who? My master Abraham. Now I wonder, is again, this him impersonally claiming God as you just, my, my master serves you? Or is there any element of personal faith in this God of Abraham that Eliezer has? Because I, I'm starting to think that this was not just about Abraham or Isaac only. 
This is about to become a personal encounter or experience for this servant. It's a personal moment for his faith. And this is similar to what happens with Jesus in Samaria, right? To link it back to the woman at the well and, and um, how Jesus goes to Samaria. Well, the disciples there, uh, when he encounters all the Samaritans that get brought out by this woman, it's just as much about the disciples and their faith as it is about Samaria who's benefiting from their presence. And so I wonder if that's something that's happening here. He goes, blessed be God, you, you've not forsaken your steadfast love and faithfulness to my master. As for me, the Lord has led me in the way to the house of my master's kinsmen. So it's not just you love Abraham, like you loved him enough to personally work within me and lead me to the right way. Like praise be to God. So it seems that in the master's mind, possibly, uh, maybe this is speculation, but he goes, blessed are you, you've not forsaken your steadfast love toward my master. Was there any doubt in his mind that God loved and favored Abraham still? Just a question I have. You know, is there any element of surprise? Like, wow, he actually still loves Abraham, still cares for him. Look at what he's done for us. And was there any reason up to this point to think that God might have been done with Abraham and his family? No matter what, this is about God showing his steadfast love, his faithful love to Abraham, and even the servant, those who are attached to the household of Abraham. He becomes a personal witness of the love of God that he shows to Abraham, just as the disciples are eyewitnesses to the favor and the love that God has bestowed upon his son Jesus. Then the young woman ran and told her mother's household about these things, right? Um, Rebecca had a brother whose name was Laban. We'll see him come up later with Jacob. Laban ran out toward the man to the spring, right? As soon as he saw the ring, interesting. Emphasis on the valuables. He pays attention to the valuable treasures. And heard the words of Rebecca, his sister, the man spoke. He, she said, the man spoke to me, and he went to the man. And he was standing by the camels at the spring, and he said, Come in, O blessed of the Lord. There is some obvious favor and blessing on the servant here. Laban saw the gold. He welcomes the servant. We see the similar thing with the Samaritan woman going back to the city, bringing the rest of the city out, uh, hearing the words of Jesus. They encounter him. They believe. But here the servant is called the blessed of the Lord. It's interesting how God's blessing on Abraham is extended to all of those who have any kind of relationship to Abraham and are part of his household. Um, how far do we take this? We at least say that God's favor towards Abraham is kind of overflowing onto the servant in terms of giving him success. And he goes, why do you stand outside? I've prepared the house and a place for the camels. Right? This is a hospitable family. Right? So the man came to the house and unharnessed the camels, gave straw and fodder to the camels. There was water to wash his feet and the feet of the men. Now, where'd these guys come from, right? This man is obviously not alone with 10 camels. You'd expect him to need some help. This is a pretty large party to welcome into your home. And I wonder, why are we not told about the men until now, as if they're just background? Now, it's important that they're here, right? Then food was set before him to eat, but he said, I will not eat until I've told you what I need to tell you. So he said, I am Abraham's servant, and the Lord has greatly blessed my master, right? And there's evidence of that with this encounter the servant has um, with the family. And he's become great. Like he's given him flocks and herds and silver and gold and servants and camels and donkeys. And Sarah, my master's wife, even bore a son to my master when she was old. Like they would have known how old Abraham was when he left and how he was still barren, him and Sarah. So this would have been like, whoa. And he's given him all that he has. Like Isaac's going to inherit everything. My master made me swear, saying, you shall not take a wife from my son from the Canaanites, in whose land I dwell. Go to my father's house and to my clan and take a wife for my son. And I said to my master, what if the woman will not follow me? But he said, the Lord before whom I have walked will send his angel with you and prosper your way. In other words, Abraham, apparently, I didn't, I failed to mention this. Abraham is not doubting that the servant will be successful. He's like, oh no, my God, I know his goodness. He'll send his angel before you. You'll be prosperous. 
take a wife for my son. You'll be free from my oath if she doesn't come back. And so I came today, right? And then he recaps what happened. I'm standing by the spring of the water. I said, Lord, let the virgin who comes out to draw water to whom I'll say, please give me some water and let her say, drink, I'll even water your camels. Let that be the one that you've given my master's son. Emphasis on Isaac being the master's son. Okay, hold on to that. Before I'd finished speaking, Rebecca came out, right? And so he's just recapping all this. Skip down to verse 49, because we just saw all of this play out. It's just him explaining his story. Now then, if you're going to show steadfast love and faithfulness to my master, tell me. Now the ball's in their court. God has shown love. Will you do the same? That I may turn to the right hand or to the left. Now, something inside of me goes, oh, sounds a lot like when Jesus sends out the 72 or the 12. And Jesus sends them out as extensions or ambassadors of him and his kingdom and his kingship. And they go out and every house they find themselves in, they're supposed to give peace. And if there's no peace that's reciprocated, they take their peace back. They dust the feet, the, their feet off against them and they walk away and leave. But if they return the peace, that house, then they, oh, favor and blessing be upon you as well. And so it's this idea of God has favored the Son, shown blessing upon Jesus as the anointed chosen Messiah, right? But you have a personal choice to love him back. You know, at, you know, receiving the ambassadors he sent with the good news they're bringing. You know, I wonder if there's any allusion within this story to that idea. Laban and Bethuel answered, because hmm. this is an incredibly risky thing to do, to let your daughter go with a group of strangers, a bunch of men, that claim to come from one of your relatives. But he has shared some personal information, like his name's Abraham, he was barren, we know his wife Sarah, and God has blessed them, right? So there's at least some information that they're like, well, I mean, he has to know Abraham to know these things. They had to trust this stranger's words and believe. Laban and Bethuel answered, the thing has come from the Lord. Remember, Bethuel is the father of Rebekah, if I am not mistaken. The thing has come from the Lord. And I wonder, what is their experience in history with the Lord God? Is he just one among many for them? Now I'm talking about Laban and Bethuel and their household and out there in, in um, is it Paran? Wherever he's sent. Like, what is their experience with the true and living God of Abraham? Because apparently they know enough to go, this is from the Lord. How did they determine that? How did they discern that? Right? We cannot speak to you good or bad. Rebecca's before you. Let her be the wife of your master's son as the Lord has spoken. Like there's this emphasis on the Lord has said, the Lord has favored, the Lord has loved. God is in the midst of all of this, orchestrating this, and this perfect story, not perfect, but you know what I mean, to make it work out for good. And this is the first time we see Rebecca's father mentioned as being present or doing anything. So a question I have is, why is it that we see Laban and Bethuel answering in unison? As if they're both giving permission. Yeah, you can, Rebecca can go, with, can go with you guys. And they admit the thing is from the Lord, so I wonder, what is their relationship with the Lord God? When Abraham's servant heard their words, he bowed himself to the earth before the Lord. There's another personal like experience the servant is having with this, this God of his master. And he can't help but bow himself in reverence in this sacred moment. moment. And the servant brought out jewelry of silver and gold and garments and gave them to Rebecca. It's like, bro, you just showered her in gifts already. More, Mary Poppins? He also gave to her brother and to her mother costly ornaments. He gave to who? To her brother, to her mother. Costly ornaments. Pause. Laban and his mother are blessed by their proximity to Rebecca, whom the Lord has chosen to be the wife of Isaac, the heir of Abraham. Why isn't Bethuel, the father of Rebekah, mentioned here as receiving any gifts? Just a question I have. Why is he not mentioned? Why isn't he not receiving any gifts? Where is he? Didn't he just say, you have my permission and blessing? And he and the men who were with him ate and drank, and they spent the night there. When they arose in the morning, he said, send me away to my master. Again, her brother and mother, nothing about Bethuel, said, let the young woman remain with us a while, at least ten days. Right, 10 camels, 10 days, something there. I don't know. After that, she can go. Right? So there's some kind of period that needs to uh, pass for them to be okay with her leaving. 10 days is the period of time. And again, why isn't the father mentioned as giving blessing or having an opinion? Uh, it's as if Laban is stepping into the role of 
patriarchal head and father. Hmm? But he said to them, don't delay me. Like the Lord has prospered my way. Don't, <laughs> don't be ruining this. Send me away that I may go back to my master. And they said, we'll call Rebecca in and ask her. And they called Rebecca and said, you want to go with this man? She said, I will go. So they sent away Rebecca, their sister, and her nurse, Abraham's servant, and his men. And look at what they do. They blessed Rebecca. Our sister, may you become thousands of ten thousands. The, this is the kind of blessing God bestowed upon Abraham and his offspring, right? May your offspring possess the gate of those who hate him. Right? We'll see Jesus say, the gates of hell won't prevail against my church. God told Abraham in Genesis 15, uh, the gates of your enemies won't prevail against your descendants and, and the people. So I, I wonder, this blessing that's coming out from them, why do we have this spoken blessing as if they can determine her future? Or is this just inspired prophecy that's in line with the will of God? Because she's told exactly what Abraham is told by God about the gates of their enemies not being able to stand against their descendants. Then Rebecca and her young women arose and rode on the camels, followed the man, and the servant took Rebecca and went his way. Wow, that must have been a scary moment. And there's obviously more women here. She took her young women, not just her nurse, right? So now we have more than just the nurse and Rebecca. We've got a whole caravan of people. Um, and now watch where Isaac ends up being found. So they're going back. Isaac had returned from Beer Lahai Roy. And if you're going, who cares about this place? I do. I care. Okay? Isaac is dwelling in the Negev. The last time we saw Isaac was in Genesis 22, about to be sacrificed on Mount Moriah. Then Abraham goes back to his men, and they go back home. Isaac, nothing about him. Okay? That doesn't mean he didn't go, but he's definitely not mentioned, like, outright and clearly as going with Abraham. So Isaac is dwelling in the region. Beer Lahai Roy is where God met Hagar at the well in Genesis 16. That's exactly the place. So after the incident in Genesis 22, it does not seem as though Isaac went with his dad to Beer Sheba, which is a bit north of Beer Laharoi. And it doesn't seem like he went with his mom, who's at Hebron among the oaks of Mamre. Isaac seems to go into the region where Ishmael and Hagar live, because they're said to be wandering and he grows up in that wilderness, in that region of the Negev. And then we have Isaac there. So is there a chance that he went to stay with them for a while after the whole traumatizing event of Genesis 22. You know, would he have even been welcomed by them? Would, th would there have been any hostility? You know, questions that we have. But it just seems like a coincidence that he's dwelling in the region where Hagar and Ishmael are living, and it's not near Mama, and it's not near Dada, at least like close enough to be living with them. But it's in a different location. Right? So one of the questions we have is, where's Isaac during all these past two chapters? He wasn't mentioned in the end of Genesis 22. He isn't mentioned in Genesis 23. And he doesn't seem to be in the same place as his father after Genesis 22. Because remember, Sarah died in Hebron, most likely by the oaks of Mamre. Right? But we saw in the last chapter that Abraham went to live in Beersheba. So you have Mama in Hebron, you have Abraham in Beersheba. And I, I wonder, did they eventually migrate back to Hebron together? Right? And that's just not mentioned. Or did they live separately because of what happened with Isaac? Either way, Isaac is said to be returning from Beer Laharoi, which is about 30 to 40 miles away from where Abraham was said to be living in Beersheba. And so Isaac could definitely be living with Abraham at Beersheba. Uh, it's a 30 to 40 mile trek. Is he just out there in the wilderness right now? We, we don't know, um, but it doesn't seem likely based on the story because we're about to see him go into his mother's tent, which is likely at Hebron where she died, unless it got moved by Abraham. And we're not told all these different details. So watch what happens. Isaac went out to meditate in the field toward evening. I wonder why we're told that Isaac is meditating, right? What's he, what's he thinking about? What's he, what's he wondering about? This is the first time we're blatantly told in the Genesis story that someone is meditating and it's Isaac. 
So what is he thinking about? What is this thing that has him, you know, I wouldn't say frazzled, but just something he's, he's considering, meditating on. Is it God? Is it his promises? Is it, you know, what happened in Genesis 22? Or is this likely connected to his mother's death in the last chapter? Because of what we're told about him in the next few verses is he's mourning Rebecca, or rather his, 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 his mom, Sarah. Rebecca comforts him in you know, all these different things. So it, it could be about his mother's death. He's still mourning, considering what happened, you know. And watch, watch the shift in the story. Isaac goes out to meditate, lifts up his eyes, sees camels coming. Rebecca lifts up her eyes. And when she saw Isaac, she dismounted from the camel. And she said to the servant, who's that man walking in the field to meet us? The servant said, that's my master. No, that's your master's son, Eliezer. <laughs> that's not your master. Abraham's your master. I wonder if Abraham, sending at this time in his life, a servant to find a wife for Isaac, um, which we can do the math and figure out how old Abraham was when he died, how old Isaac was when he got a wife. We can figure all that out. Whether or not Abraham knows his life is coming to an end or not, he sends the servant to go and find a wife and a bride for his son, which notes at least that Abraham is aware of a transition that is taking place generationally. The mantle is being passed to the son, Isaac. And now the narrative explicitly, very clearly says that the servant recognizes Isaac as master now. Not son of the master, not servant of God, but as master. Something has shifted. There's a big shift in the Abraham story right here. Up to this point, Isaac's referred to as master's son, servant of God. But it looks as though this moment is the official passing on of the baton. And now Isaac is has become the chosen partner God is primarily working with now. Now the camera's focused in and the story is focused on Isaac. So we have to go, what caused the switch, at least in the servant's mind? Maybe not narratively, but for the servant here, what made him see Isaac differently now? Is it because Isaac has a wife and it's a, it's a, you know, coming into manhood and the next step and the evolution of his maturity? But either way, seems as though the servant officially views Isaac as the master of the house, taking over as the heir. And so that would make sense that Abraham sends the servant. If Isaac is not with Abraham, right, um, then this whole story makes a little more sense. That Abraham has his servant, goes, Isaac's not with me. Go find a wife for him. Go to him. The story's going to continue with Isaac now. Just my thoughts. The servant said, My master, she took her veil, covered herself, and the servant told Isaac all the things that he had done. In other words, watch this. Isaac doesn't seem to be aware of not just what happened with the servant, but the fact that Abraham even sent the servant out, which Isaac would be aware of that if he lived with Abraham because he'd know Eliezer's gone. Abraham would explain himself. Maybe that's just me speculating, reading into the text. But Isaac brought her into the tent of Sarah. That's kind of weird. Not really. His mother. And took Rebekah and she became his wife. This, I think, is key to him taking over the family name now. And he loved her. So Isaac was comforted after his mother's death. Is there anything within Abraham that knows Isaac is taking this extra hard? And Abraham wants to comfort his son and, and you know do something nice that would help him come out of this morning and provide whatever it is that Isaac needs to come out of that and into the next stage of his life. Is there anything in Abraham that, that knows a wife is what he needs? You know, but either way, why is Isaac taking his wife into his deceased mother's tent? Is it to honor her? Is it to mourn her? Is it to remember her? To tell his wife about her? Why are we told this detail? And I think it relates to him being comforted and mourning over his, his mom. Is this to symbolize Rebecca taking over the role of master's wife now? Because Isaac just stepped into the role of the master of the house, seemingly. And the next chapter is all about Isaac taking over, right? Um, as we'll see in chapter 25. But it seems Isaac now lives in Hebron. That's, that's what it appears to be. That's where his mom's tent was, near the Oaks of Mamre, somewhere around there. He's in the Negev, somewhere near the well that God visited Hagar at. Um, and Isaac's comforted by God through Rebecca. Apparently, Isaac has been taking it extra hard, and God comforts him 
by giving him a wife. And the fact that he needs comfort shows where his headspace is and his emotional state has been at, which again might be why he was meditating in the field when Rebecca found him. This whole story, though, as we close this chapter, I know this is long, but this whole story is about a father providing a bride for his only begotten son through his servant's faithfulness to go and prepare and find a bride. I want us to think about that. This is how the New Testament, even the Old Testament actually, speaks of the prophets, speaks of Moses finding a bride, bringing out that bride to Yahweh at Mount Sinai to come enter into covenant. They break the covenant. This is how the prophets are, 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 are viewed as being commissioned by God to bring back a faithless bride and you know prepare a bride for his coming. This is how the prophets are spoken of in the New Testament with Jesus, is that the prophets are sent by God the servants of God, to prepare a people for his son. John the Baptist is the culmination of that, the ultimate prophet in terms of like seeing Jesus and being the best of the prophets. But eventually, God sends his son. After the prophets have prepared the way and John the Baptist has done his job, the father sends the son to go and acquire a bride for himself. And so in Ephesians chapter 4, we see the role of the prophets, apostles, teachers, evangelists, shepherds, those, that fivefold ministry is similar to Eliezer's role in this story. God is preparing a bride for his son by the work of his servants. You know, the prophets, evangelists, teachers, all these different roles, parts of the body, they're teaching, they're training, they're equipping the body and the bride of Jesus, whom Jesus has already acquired, whom Jesus has already purified and cleansed, but the sanctification aspect is being outworked, worked out rather, by those whom God has appointed. But this whole story just screams gospel. God finding a bride for his son. God sending servants ahead of him. God sending the prophets to prepare and ultimately sending his son to acquire that bride and pay for that bride with his own precious blood, which links us back to Genesis 22 where Isaac was almost sacrificed. So all these different things. I know this was a longer session, but I wanted to keep this all in one video instead of break it up. I just didn't think that would be wise or helpful. Um, so I apologize for the length of this. Hopefully you'll stick around for the next chapter. Genesis 25 is where we will jump into uh, Isaac taking over. And Isaac, the story continuing with this new chosen partner and patriarchal head being Isaac. So stick around for that one and I'll see you guys in the next Bible study walkthrough. Hey, don't forget to like this video and subscribe for more biblical content just like this. We have hundreds of videos, but you might be most interested in these ones right here. Also visit our website for all of our free resources and classes. And thank you so much for partnering with us financially to make this ministry even possible. Keep moving towards Jesus and I'll see you in the next video.